Fantastic. So, folks, I'm going to go ahead and uh, move forward here. Everybody should be able to now see the title slide in about 30 seconds. I'm going to officially kick us off and uh, get us going. I'm excited. Uh, many of you here I know are um, servicing financial services companies. Some of you are financial services organizations yourself. And I know based on the questions that you've sent in that understanding how COVID is impacting digital communication and engagement is, is really important to many of you. Uh, now more than ever, this is an important discussion to have. So if you're ready to get started, let's go ahead and drop a yes in the chat. I keep this interactive. If you've ever been on one of our other panels, you know that I like to keep it lively. It's not uh, like some of those other webinars that you're on where you, you fall asleep. I'm gonna keep you awake and engaged. So go over there and drop a yes in the chat and let's keep this interactive. If you're ready to get started, drop me a yes. Awesome, I'm seeing the yeses coming in. So I'm gonna keep this moving at a crisp rate, folks. Good morning, thank you for being here. Uh, my job today is to moderate this discussion and get us to the Q&A um, somewhere around 45 uh, to 50 minutes into the discussion today. And so joining me um, in this discussion today are Alan Berger, uh, Steve Duperry, Anthony Gray, Andrew Smee, and Len Smofsky. Hopefully I pronounced everyone's name correctly there. Uh, the voice that you're hearing here is Dave Rosendahl. I'm moderating this, the uh, discussion today. I'm going to introduce myself here in just a moment. But first, more importantly, I want you to hear from your panel. So uh, first up on the upper left here on the screen, and I'm not sure where he appears in your camera, is Alan Berger, CEO of InfoSlip. So Alan, thank you for being here, and would love for you just to take a moment to introduce yourself to the audience, uh, who you are and, and who you do it for, and, and uh, let's get to meet you a little bit. Hi, uh, thanks, David. Um, yeah, really excited to be here. Uh, my passion over the last decade and even today has been reinventing the, the digital document. Um, my, that, that passion has led me to founding a company that turns digital statements that we all use today um, to be a lot more useful and engaging than just you know, the facsimiles of paper counterparts that we use. Um, so to that end, um, I have extensive experience gained from the customer communications that we have deployed thousands of times across the globe and I'm happy to share this with, all, with you all today. Fantastic. Well, thank you for being here. We appreciate you and, and you um, investing your time um, in today's discussion. And I'm sure it's going to be very in insightful and valuable for the audience. Um, second here, uh, towards the top and middle, we have Steve Duperry. Um, and Steve, thank you for being here. I'd love to hear just a little bit about you and introduce yourself to, uh, to the audience today. Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> Steve Duperry, uh, like Dave said, and I'm VP of Operations for CSI's Business Solution Group. Um, I held a number of positions in my career over, over 20 years spanning application development, product management, sales, and now operations in financial technology. However, all of my roles have been about uh, providing and supporting technology solutions, uh, particularly around digital and automation for community banks in the United States. So this is a topic that's uh, near and dear to my heart, and so I'm excited to be participating in today's uh, panel. Thank you, Steve. We're looking forward to it as well. Uh, next up is Anthony Gray. Anthony, good morning. Thank you, or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Thank you for being here and uh, introduce yourself to the folks that are here with us today. Uh, thank you, David, uh, and good day to everybody. Um, I, my name is Anthony Gray, and I, I founded a company called Nikea DX a few years ago. Uh, but my background is in accounting and finance and business transformation. I've led uh, many organizations over my 30 plus career. 30 plus years in, in financial services and technology. And uh, we founded this company in 2017 to focus in on digital customer engagement. So uh, this is a topic and a, and a set of topics that's near and dear to my heart. I'm looking forward to sharing uh, some of our thoughts with you all today. Fantastic. And next to me here on the screen, to my right on the screen is Andrew Smee. Andrew, welcome uh, today and introduce yourself as well. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the conversation. So uh, Andrew Smee, as you've already heard a couple of times, I'm a financial services partner uh, with PricewaterhouseCoopers here in Toronto, uh, focused on data analytics and uh, really work a lot with mid, with what I call mid-market clients uh, across the financial services spectrum. Fantastic. Thank you for being here. And uh, last but certainly not least, Len, introduce yourself and a good day to you as well, sir. Thanks so much, uh, David, and uh, welcome everybody. Yeah, I'm Len Smofsky, co-founder and EVP of Blue Rush. Um, Blue Rush helps financial institutions improve customer engagement, satisfaction, and particularly conversion in the online channel. We do that through 
into video, which is our interactive and personalized video platform. Fantastic. Well, thank you for being here. And thank you to Blue Rush for allowing me to moderate the discussion today. In case we've never met, I'm Dave Rosendahl. I'm the co-founder and president at MindFire. And uh, my organization is a software company. We help uh, many companies, including financial services organizations, use what we call um, opti-channel communication uh, to reach customers and prospects on the channel and device that's best for them. Doing this one-to-one -one, um, you know, on a one-off basis is easy, but doing it at scale is certainly not. That's where we come in. And as you're gonna hear today, that's an important part of the mix here as we talk about how to communicate digitally with our customers and our prospects. So um, thank you for having me today. Riel um, is going to drop um, a link to uh, my profile here in LinkedIn because if you enjoy today's session, we moderate a lot of these. Let's get connected on LinkedIn. Um, follow me there and you'll hear about other upcoming sessions like the one we're doing today um, if this is of interest to you. So I hope to be able to unpack uh, some of the things that are of, of interest to everybody who's here today in a way that is going to be insightful and help you kind of understand some of these issues from a variety of angles. So as you came into the session, um, you may remember that I asked you, we asked you your number one question for the, for the panel that's here today. And if, if you look at kind of what's come in, this is what you've all said is important to you. And I know it's not necessarily easy to see some of the emergent patterns here, but you can see, you know, digital is on your mind, engagement's on your mind, marketing is on one's mind here. Um, so what we thought might be a little bit easier is if we um, kind of zoom in a bit and look at the top 10 things that have kind of popped out here, the top 10 words. And you can more clearly see, um, you know, COVID obviously is on everyone's mind, uh, digital engagement, what do we do now? Um, what are we supposed to do um, at, at present? Um, how, how do we get new customers? How is print involved? And so these are the themes that kind of came through as we looked at everything that's on your mind. And so to kind of bucket these questions and these issues that are of importance to you, we're going to kind of break this down into three parts. First, we're going to start with COVID-19's impact on the shift to digital. Okay, I want to start there and kind of explore what that looks like, um, followed by then kind of digging into understanding exactly what does our panel mean? What do we mean when we say contextual digital engagement? Okay, and then I want to kind of land with talking about how do we actually start to do this stuff? If we actually want to put this into practice, what does it take to do? And my goal, like I said, is to bring us home around 45 minutes in and leave plenty of time for q and I can actually see your questions as they're coming in here and that's helpful and useful. So I'm gonna ask you throughout the session to stay engaged and interactive. I can see that here on the screen, all right? So let's start this off um, with the first kind of bucket of questions, the first topic that kind of seemed to be of most um, interest to everybody. And that's, you know, if you look at the screen here, we kind of do this uh, slightly in jest around the situation that we find ourselves in, um, where, you know, as organizations, we kind of thought that digital transformation was years away and that our companies wouldn't have to necessarily do anything um, soon about that. And then bam, you know, kind of out of nowhere comes COVID, right? And we find ourselves with an immediate need to be able to communicate with our customers in ways that previously, you know, for the average person at least, never really crossed our mind. So the first question that I want to pose to our panel and solicit their views on is you know what's happening now and what do we think is going to happen next with respect to communication given covid so steve uh, i'm going to turn this over to you first if you're ready what are you hearing from your clients in this regard how is communication impacted right now by covid yeah dave uh, i am ready so um i'll i'll kick us off you know <clears throat> The first and probably the most impactful message um, regarding digital that we're hearing from from our customers who are community banks across the U.S. is over the past few months, um, not only are they observing, but we're also seeing it with the data that we monitor as far as usage and adoption goes, uh, that uh, use and adoption is increasing at a pretty high rate. Hmm. Um, of the digital channel and its capability. So we're seeing month over month and year over year exponential growth in digital logins, transfers, mobile remote deposit, um, deposited checks, person to person payments, et cetera. Um, mm. so, so what does that tell us? Well, and, and basically what we know over the past 20 years is the, the financial industry has seen slow but steady adoption in the digital channel as it's matured. 
and as more people have come into their kind of banking life, um, you know, most of the innovative customers who are willing to try new and exciting services for self-service have by and large adopted many of the services I already mentioned above. However, for a large segment of, of your banking customers, there was no real catalyst forcing change uh, other than convenience. So it was still convenient for folks to run through um, a, a drive through and deposit their check uh, that they had, or it was easy for them to, to pay someone back with cash for a concert ticket or call into the branch or call center and transfer some money to another account. However, with quarantine and social distancing from COVID-19, yep. end users were forced to try these digital options. And guess what? Uh, they like them. Um, that they, they like how they're able to move into this new digital era and, and handle their banking life. So I've, I've heard time after time um, through meetings, preparing for this, for this panel discussion, through conversations with family and friends is I'm never going back, back to the branch. It's so easy now. Yep. So that's, re that's really what we're hearing. And uh, Andrew, you look like you're ready there with your, your Bible of uh, literature there for us. What, what's your <laughs> view on this? Anything you want to add to what you're seeing? I, I couldn't agree more with Steve. I think he's got it spot on. I think this is, as the slide says, right, it is a permanent behavior change that we're, that we're definitely seeing. I think, you know, a lot of folks who used to go into the branch went into the call centers. And then, you know, frankly, we had a lot of loan deferral programs that were kind of neat here in Canada. The wait time I heard some of my, some of the, the, the clients were, were saying, you know, up to five hour wait times to get on with, uh, with a person. So, yeah really driving the, you know, the behavior change into thinking that's a stupid waste of time. I've got to actually embrace the digital. So exactly as Steve was saying, I think the other side, and it's back to the, the last slide with the pendulum there, I'm going to refer to it as a pendulum, not a wrecking ball. Um, the organization itself is really changing a lot too. One of my favorite stories is, uh, is actually from uh, a risk group where you know the business was wanting to drive change they were really trying to you know quickly adapt all of these new processes and technologies and surprisingly they actually got all the risk people in one room sometimes more than once a day for the risk people themselves to you know you know how it is when you're trying to make a product change in a large organization like a bank you got to go to compliance you got to go to risk you got to go back to compliance you got to go to legal they were all in the room instant decisions if mm -hmm. they couldn't make a decision you knew what needed to come next so I think it's actually both dimensions. I think both the, um, the consumers are changing, but I think the organizations have really kind of seen the light and are trying to now drive a much more digital uh, perspective. Anthony, in the work that you do with clients, if I could get you to weigh in here, um, how do you see this event, this time in history, as an opportunity for us to embrace the push towards digital adoption? Uh, and thank you for that question, David. Um, Digital adoption programs often hit uh, kind of a wall. They get to 20, 30, maybe even 50% and rarely go beyond that, particularly um, in, in the engagement and the opt-in number of their clients. But with the crisis, and, and if FIs are able to create some kind of meaningful contextual digital experience, it could be the breakthrough event that many of them have been looking for. Uh, the right combination of digital assets made available to consumers may lead to a breakthrough event. It could, it could help drive a lot of the adoption rates uh, much, much higher. And that's what we're hearing from a lot of the executives that we meet with on a regular basis. And Alan, uh, you know, this, this next thought, I kind of want to summarize by just kind of reflecting on the fact that you know, we're, we're, we're kind of in this new normal, what people call this new normal, more maybe what, at least here in the United States for us, we're 70 to 80 days into, I think, this, this situation. And, and through this new normal, as I reflect on it, it's kind of brought about new behaviors in people and consumers, at least that's what I think. So I'm curious as to your views on that. What are your thoughts on this new normal and what is that doing to consumer behavior? Um. Yeah, we're looking at, uh, thanks for that, Dave. Um, you know, we, 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 this new normal gets bandied around, but what does it really mean for us um, uh, yep. in, the, in, in the financial services space? And, you know, we've seen a sharp increase of the number of people that traditionally would go to get a paper statement or a branch customer who are now engaging digitally. This is the building what Anthony has said and what Steve has said. Um, they're engaging digitally and it's often for their first time. And 
we need to be there to meet those customers on their terms, onboard them, embrace them, and help them with that digital journey. Because these are these are customers that that traditionally probably might never have become digital customers, and now they're now they are digital customers for the first time, and we need to look after them. I use a, a simple example of of my father-in-law. He's 82 years old. Um, we loaded a banking app on his phone years ago. He never used it. Last month, he made his first payment. And mm. the first thing he said to us after that was, well, he's never, ever going into a branch again if he can help it. So wow. that for me crystallizes it for me is that, is, that, is that there are audiences that were traditionally out of our reach. They're now in our reach and we need to embrace it. Yeah, fantastic example. That's that's exactly what I was wondering. Um, you know, as, as you look across the customers that you work with and, and the consumer behavior, if that's what you're seeing, Len, from your uh, vantage point over there at Blue Rush, I know you work with a lot of uh, organizations that are going through quite a bit of change right now. What are you seeing emerge in this new normal and, and kind of how is that impacting the digital experience and um, digital banking that folks are engaged in right now? Thanks. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, seeing that they're, you know, just to acknowledge what everybody knows, everyone's got a story about their, their dad, their father-in-law, their mother, somebody who never banked online now does it and mm -hmm. saw the light. And I have to say financial institutions across the board, not just banks, insurers, like many of them have solved day-to-day -day transactions. So imagine, you know, if we didn't have that today, I think this is brilliant technology. If, if, you know, Alan's 80 odd year old father-in-law can do it. I think it means it's pretty much pervaded everyone. On the other hand, when you're talking about making decisions about which is the right mortgage for me, which is the right credit card for me, which is the right checking account for me, most financial institutions have admitted or they'll have numbers that show those decisions happen still today or at least up until COVID in a branch, in a call center, those are difficult to access now. So this is a real challenge. And when we talk about accelerating the digital channel for us, this is what we mean. Mm -hmm. This is the ability to get customers informed so that they can make those digital uh, conversions and decisions online. So think, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Dan. Well, um, th this is actually a good slide. We just, you know, it goes from no personalization through segmentation and right up into individualization. And I think what this speaks to is what is going to be required for financial institutions to arrive where they're allowing people to really make informed decisions. And that's what it comes down to. I have to understand how that credit card works, not just generically, and, and there's a lot of lift there for me to read through everything and then compare it, um, but I have to understand how it's gonna work in my case. Um, and, and in order to do that, I need individualized assistance. And that's largely the white elephant in the digital room. There is not a lot of assistance in the online channel, and therefore the vast majority I've seen figures are, are well over 70% product decisions still being made the same way they were made largely 20, 30 years ago. Which represents an opportunity for all of us who are here talking about how to uh, embrace this. Uh, Andrew, I wanna, I wanna get your thoughts on this question before we move on, but also to the folks who are here sending in questions. Uh, if we don't answer them in real time, we will try to come back to them at the end. Uh, Riel is capturing them for us, so don't worry, we are gonna answer your questions. But before we move off of this topic, Andrew, we'd just love to get your thoughts and your perspective on this question as to, um, you know, the moment that we find ourselves in, and if you could just give us some context as to how you think about this. For sure. And, and so this is a slide I've used probably for the last decade or so. But I think, you know, what's interesting now is, is that, in fact, I think we actually have the capability to do that far, you know, right end of the individualization. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the ability to, you know, as Len was sort of saying, pull the right data together, that's usually the hardest stage. Um, but our ability to actually run predictive analytics, next likely sale, um, you know, really understand the needs of the customers. Like it's, it's so exciting, the point that we're at now is, is you know, getting, that, getting the data together and then using it to, to, to gather those insights to, uh, you know, to, to sell product. So the second kind of question group that came in uh, for you, panel, 
Uh, with the backdrop kind of of COVID as this pivotal moment that's exposing many of these opportunities and challenges that we've been talking about, this push towards digital, um, it is really questions around what exactly are folks doing with contextual digital engagement? What does that mean? What are some examples of that? So when we use this phrase, um, kind of the textbook definition is contextual engagement is a, is a strategy where brands are delivering relevant messages to consumers at their moment of need through their preferred channel. Um, you know, simply put, personalized, real-time engagement. But what I would like to know from you, panel, you know, when we dig into the data, when we actually try to understand this a bit further, um, we find that somewhere around 6% of FIs currently are deploying advanced personalization technology through their digital channels. So that's, to me, that's a pretty small number. Uh, Andrew, let me, let me turn this over to you again. Help me understand this disparity. Does this align with what we're seeing and what the panel is saying? Yeah, I, I think it absolutely does. You know, I would say it probably skews a, a tiny bit optimistic, um, uh, you know, in that, you know, 59% are saying they're at the, they're already at the, uh, uh, you know, the emerging stage, which I think is a bit, a, a bit, uh, a bit optimistic, but okay. yeah, no, I, I think people really are starting to, to take advantage of these capabilities and, and are, are really kind of pushing uh, pushing in the right direction on this for sure. So, Anthony, then uh, from your vantage point, if you can like uh, you know connect the dots, we've got some data here on the screen. Um, yeah. the, the, you know the, the data that Andrew just spoke to as well. How does how do you see this technology gap, um, you know, being filled by contextual engagement? How how is that now a requirement to help us actually fill that gap? Yeah, and thank you for the question. Uh, David, there's there's a few things I think we need to understand, especially I spent a little over 20 plus years in financial services and various transformational roles. Um, those of us who come from banking know that every transaction is a moment of truth for the consumer. Um, you've got to either, you know, success or failure in that transaction, acceptance or decline in that transaction. Hmm. Um, but every time that 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 customer has an interaction where their bank is required they need they need to have a sense that the bank is going to come through for them um, what's also true is that it's relevant that when a customer chooses to contact their bank whether it's through a contact center or something else that's also a moment of truth yep right um, if the customer feels a sense of satisfaction that their query was understood and that the context of the interaction was, was led, uh, led to a clear and concise outcome, um, then the bank and, and the financial institutions led to success. And, and, and those, those moments of where you actually accomplish your goal, working with your financial institution, that's, that's what's going to create stickiness and, and entrenchment with that customer. Steve, you know, as we, as we think about these customers and how they are evolving in terms of their preferences, their needs, and their expectations of financial services institutions, what do you think um, customers are going to expect next? And how can we plan accordingly for that? What are your thoughts on, you know, how to, how to, how to think about that? Well, yeah, and if I may add a comment to the last uh, part of the discussion, too, regarding personalization. Um, you know, and I think I think financial institutions sit on a treasure trove of data mm -hmm. uh, that they have about their customers that gives them the ability uh, to provide that personalized experience, as opposed to other technology providers in other industries that may have four or five fields about a customer. Institutions know where they spend their money every time, how they spend it, uh, all the accounts they have, their loans, their credit scores, their there's just a treasure trove of data there. And so I think we're on the, just scraping the surface as far as the capabilities of personalization. And I think institutions need to be thinking about what do those personalized uh, experiences look like and what data do I need to provide that personalization and then breaking down those silos uh, so, so that you can you do that. It all starts with the infrastructure and the, and the data and then the, the experience comes from that. Um, you know, uh, I'd love to throw out, uh, you know, some wild predictions about what's next. Um, I, but I, I think you use the word anticipate um, mm -hmm. in your question. And I love that word. 
Um, I think there's uh, perhaps no more important skill for organizations today than, you know, with the technology environment, given uh, what it is and how fast things are moving, than the ability to anticipate. And so today, I think a focus for organizations to uh, develop some ability to just anticipate, take what you know, um, uh, things like we know uh, that um, high-speed cellular bandwidth is becoming ubiquitous with 5G. We know that data storage and computing power is becoming virtually limitless with cloud, uh, cloud banking with AWS, Azure, and the like. We know demographically that baby boomers are retiring every day, more and more every day, and millennials are now the majority of the workforce. So there's all these trends, what I would call hard trends, that you can start to build in what you know, and then as things uh, emerge, um, like the pandemic, for example, you have the ability to respond um, uh, and be agile faster, and therefore continue to create competitive advantages and, and experiences for your customers that meet the needs of the market today. You know, my last point would be that, that digital's really blurred the lines of what customer expectations are. Uh, traditionally, the bank experience was the bank experience. The restaurant experience was the restaurant experience and the shopping experience was its own unique experience. Digital is really blurring and combining what the customer expects uh, from their experience. So they expect their, all their digital experience to be easy, mm -hmm. frictionless, um, and, and frankly, they compare them against each other, even though they're in completely different industries. Yep. So no matter the purpose, that, that is really uh, one thing I would say that is becoming more and more of an expectation from customers. You know, Len, uh, as, I, as I reflect back on the huddles that we did to prepare for today's session, I know that you had mentioned, I believe it was Netflix as an example of contextual engagement in action. I'd just love for you to share that real quick with the audience because I think it illustrates fairly well the point that, uh, that some of you are making here. Yeah, it, it really, I think, does. If, if you think about where financial institutions are today and you think of what are we up against, when we talk about what customers expect, well, I think pretty much I speak for all of us when we say Netflix mm -hmm. has become part of our lives in the last couple of months if it wasn't before. And just look at the way that machine is structured yep. in terms of how it recommends the next thing to you and it doesn't require you to do a lot of reading. It's automatically, not with you asking for it, it's gonna play a preview. It's gonna show you enough of that to you, you're, you're informed, I'm gonna make a decision. I'm gonna watch that, I'm not gonna watch that. If you're watching a, a show with multi episodes, it knows exactly where you are even within that show. It's just an incredible piece of technology. And I think it just shows the level that is required you know, when you're making a decision on a financial product, it's different than a movie, but at the same time, it needs to have a visual base to help you make that decision along with the words. It needs to make it easier for us to get informed and decide. Right now, the work is on the customer, customer. to read yep. through a lot of text to figure it out and then read another product. And so it's really just lowering the bar so people can get it in a little bit sense, the way a great subject matter expert in human form would do. They'd ask you some questions and then they'd present to you the things that make sense in your unique case. Well, what a great lead end to your example here. I think you've prepared an example here. Let me know when you want me to go ahead and, and play the video here if you wanna set it up because as a lot of folks came into the room, the virtual room today, as I mentioned, they asked for real life examples of contextualized digital communication. What does that look like? Who's doing it well? And so I know you've prepared an example here. I'd love to have you just kind of share a little bit about that and let me know when you want me to play the video here for you. Sure, so this is uh, a TD's credit card selector. So this is, this is live on their site. Um, as is the case with most of these financial tools or calculators, it's designed to help you choose which is the right credit card for you. Now, that was, that's already there. We don't usually build them. Uh, you know, typically they're already there in place. The challenge with these tools is not that they don't make a recommendation or give you an output, but it comes in text format. So uh, let, let's start playing and I'll show you how that works. So you're gonna see in the screen here, this is just going through the standard tool. This is not something we would normally build. 
Uh, we have built them, but this is pretty much standard for financial institutions. Now, we did add something here, which is we wanted to know how much you're spending on average, and I'll show you why in a minute. It's gonna personalize a video. Now, Hi, based on your answers, it appears that the TD Cashback Visa Infinite card is the best choice for you. According to your average monthly spend, you could earn this much in cashback dollars in your first year. That's more than enough to cover the $120 annual fee. With the TD Cashback Visa Infinite card, you earn 3% in cashback dollars on eligible grocery and gas purchases and on regularly recurring bill payments set up on your account. You earn 1% on all other eligible purchases made with your card. So what's interesting is, now you didn't get to see the page very long, but before you chose the video, there was that page, those results that said, this is the card for you. And mm. you'd actually have to do a lot of scrolling on that page to actually read through everything. That's what they're asking you to do, is to, to, to read through all that stuff, scroll down, and then that stuff's not personalized. It's really generic information about that card. So it's interesting that, you know, that video basically took what was, what is a generic video about features, but it added on the front end how much you're gonna get in rewards, which is the key number for a rewards card. So by personalizing that, I've told you how it's gonna work for you. And it's actually very simple, but it has resulted in far higher conversion just by that simple fact that we made that not buried in text somewhere, it actually comes out at you as the first thing so that you're empowered to decide, oh, okay, if that card's costing me 125 a year, but I'm expecting to get 800 in rewards, I can make a decision. So this is a, this is a live example, right? This is live on TD site. This is something that they've been using? Absolutely. And, cool. and the numbers are, are very strong. The conversion lift from what was before is, is quite significant. So, Alan, I know you've got a, an example prepared here as well that kind of touches on a point that some of the uh, folks came in wondering um, around, you know, the, the sense that as the economy shifts and as organizations have to do more with less, you know, reducing operational costs and kind of focusing their talent, their remaining talent towards high value work, um, can you give us an example, and I think that's what you've prepared here of, how contextualized digital engagement can actually reduce operational costs. What does that really mean and how does that work? Alan, love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. And building on um, Len with uh, how video works, uh, what we want to do is um, leverage that heartbeat communication. If you think about it, you know, we set state customers are getting statements every, every day, every month, and often those are just ignored completely. So the example I want to talk through, and it's just one of the many, is that how we can leverage that event really to, to, to drive that contextual digital engagement. Um, you want, first of all, today what you get when you get a statement is something that doesn't fit into the rest of the digital experience. It's typically a PDF, and that's not really that capable and, and useful. I know if you ever used it on a mobile, it's not a great experience. Um, but it's possible to leave that PDF behind. And um, what we're talking about is using to using a modern document format that's interactive, that really will work well on any device, provide a better experience, and then as to your points, unlock valuable benefits and doing it at, at, at really good cost savings. Um, I see there was some, just wanted to add something in, and that is I see a lot of, one of the thick themes was print, and how do we mix print into this digital mm -hmm. mix? Yep. Well, the first thing is to acknowledge that print is not gonna go away completely. Yes, we're seeing less of it and, 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 and so forth, but it's still going to be there, and we need to bring those customers into that digital uh, fold effectively. And, we can do that by even customers are getting print, allowing them to have that digital experience by giving them a, a QR code or to that will link to a, a statement with, that provides more value or to a video. So you can have a blended experience as well. And you can use that experience that when you've got them now, you know, they've looked at something on their statement, they've seen this little QR code with some, some kind of teaser, they go into it, it's their statement that's not interactive and you can drill through and you can see a video. Well, then we want to use that event sometimes to convert them to digital or at least um, let them start using the digital assets that the customer already has. So, so you want me to go ahead and, and play the example here? Yeah, so I just want to uh, tee up that example okay. quickly. So what we're going to do here is we're going to show a, a statement that is a new generation statement, not based on a PDF. 
the statement is a consolidated statement. So one of the key cost savings that this, this statement is delivering a, 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 a credit card statement and a check statement and a savings statement and a mortgage statement. It's all in one. Um, but second of all, um, it, 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 it's allowing, as the video plays through this, you'll see there's the, in, in, in the video, you'll see that, that this person is navigating through a statement and the video is playing and that the statement is following along automatically. So you, you're blending this, this using the, the, the video to highlight the key points and then using the statement to get the detail. If you could okay. play that video. Here we go. Personalized video has already proven to be very effective at improving customer engagement and conversion particularly for statements. Now, personalized video and text-based statements can be brought together seamlessly to get the best of both, an integrated statement. Let's look at an example. Customers are notified their statement is ready by email, calling their attention to the integrated personalized video feature. When they view their statement, they are welcomed by a short personalized video introduction. It lets them know they can get a personalized video summary of their account and they can view the full digital text version at any point. The text version has all their details, while the personalized video summarizes their key information and options. Hi Brandon, here's your Primo Bank credit card statement for November 2019. This is your total balance, due on December 20th, 2019. Here's the breakdown of spending by category. This is your minimum payment. And here's your available credit. The personalized video and text version can also be synced. As the video progresses to a new section of the statement, such as reward points, the text statement can automatically show the corresponding section. This makes it easy for customers to switch back and forth as they wish. The integrated statement puts customers in the driver's seat, allowing them to better understand important account information and options, dramatically improving customer engagement and service. Very cool. I see people uh, in the audience getting really excited at these examples here, uh, Alan. So I know that uh, we're going to have some time to go through those questions. Joanne, I love your excitement. Alan, do you want to uh, kind of just wrap up kind of what we're seeing here and any final thoughts on this uh, incredible example? I'd like to talk directly to the benefits and cost savings very quickly. The first thing is if you make a statement like that, it often results in support deflection or people self-serving to, to get the answers they need, obviously. And, that, and that, that gives them a satisfaction that they get what they need instantly without having to revert to a call center and sometimes with the, the, the or a help desk with, with the frustration that goes with it. You get that consolidated statement, which means that instead of doing you know a lot of different statements, you consolidate them to one. And then also the ability to use that statement to bring all their needs into one area and then rec do recommendations, which could lead um, to, to increased revenue opportunities. I just want to wrap it up with saying that I see so many people these days using the same playbook of just trying to generate the same old PDF to their clients and trying to just make it a little pretty, uh, bit prettier. You want to do something that's more valuable to them and turn that heartbeat statement into something that offers real value and the opportunity to differentiate. Beautiful. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate the uh, example there. Anthony, is there anything you want to add to uh, from your perspective on the, 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 the benefit of this kind of approach? Uh, you're on mute, Anthony, just in case. There you go. <laughs> I figured I had spoken enough. Uh, today, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yes, I do. I, I think every, every person and the reason why we're talking about contextual digital engagement is because uh, we all have our own unique life journeys where uh, we're going through some kind of life event, like the, the person who gets their first job, they need to open a bank account to access the funds. Uh, someone who's getting married, they need life insurance, or they're ready to buy their first house, they need a mortgage. And then people reach out to their financial institutions um, for support because they need an ally in that moment. Um, and each time the bank goes and does this right and understands that moment, that context in which the person is reaching out to the bank and behaves in the context of that moment, um, it further strengthens that bond, that co covalent bond between the institution and that customer. So what we're seeing um, in, in the conversations we're having with financial institution executives is that they want to create that personalized relationship where they're meeting the customer 
in that moment so that it benefits the customer in a unique way uh, better than, let's say, a competitor will be able to service that particular customer. So the idea here is we want to make sure that that digital experience, as Alan and, and Len shared and, and demonstrated, is about that individual in that moment and what they need so that we can help them be successful and ultimately make the bank or the financial institution successful as well. Absolutely. Well, folks, let's, let's, uh, we're right on time here. I want to um, focus it now on the third uh, bucket of questions, which is that with all of this in mind, understanding that COVID has really uh, created this, this unique opportunity in time um, that is uh, pushing us forward in these regards, um, and that there's tremendous opportunity here and, and a lot of work to be done um, to make things easier for the consumer. With all of that in mind, where do we begin? Um, so I asked the panelists to kind of help us sketch out at a very high level, kind of a roadmap that we could use to think about how we want to get started here. And they've, they've kind of summarized it in five key steps. And Steve, I'm going to start with you for the first step here. Um, what, what do you see as the first um, thing that folks should be thinking about? How does a company start to identify the, the gaps in their digital infrastructure to determine where this approach is going to have the most value? Yeah, you know, I think... Uh, I think I think that's uh, the logical first step to any process is building that roadmap or building your backlog of all of the ideas that you could focus on for improving that um, customer experience. And so I thought I'd, I'd offer some, some points to where people could go to start to develop those ideas and build those ideas. And, and you know, first I mentioned earlier data. Uh, the data is huge. Looking at, um, you know, the, the data coming from uh, folks visiting your website, where are they, uh, you know, what are the click rates, what are all those types of things, looking at how, what are the highest used functions of, of your, uh, of the experience. And then, and, and so I'd start there. I'd, I'd look at uh, benchmarking against the competition. Are there certain things that, uh, that your experience provides that the competition doesn't or vice versa? And the vice versa is where you might to identify some gaps there. I think a really important thing uh, for uh, institutions to, to do is engage with your technology providers. Uh, what are their roadmaps? What are they focusing on? And learn from, from those types of things to say, you know, if uh, being aligned with those vendors on those roadmaps is really important for, 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 for doing those types of things. Interesting. So social media, I think, is a huge uh, source for looking at um, what industry consultants and, and experts are talking about as far as the digital experience. There's just a ton out there. There's people to follow, uh, you know, Twitter, LinkedIn, all the different channels. Um, so, but most importantly, and this goes back to the data, circling back to the data, is listening to your customers, both, both from a quantitative standpoint in the data, but also qualitative. What are they looking for? What are they wanting uh, to have with your institution? Advice has been a big topic that we've talked about today. Uh, that might be something that you want to start to add in. And then uh, I think once you've identified your gaps, then it just becomes about sorting those and prioritizing those and looking for those biggest um, low-hanging fruit items, if you will, biggest value with low, low effort uh, to start to chip away at that roadmap. So, Alan, Steve just mentioned data. And uh, that's, that's the second piece here that I think um, you've identified, this panel identified as the second step here. Um, and it might be obvious, but why do we feel, why do you feel that data is the, the cornerstone of this contextual engagement? Well, data is really information and information about what you know about your customer. And without data, you can't really drive, uh, you know, any personalization um, or, or, or change the context. So, um, you know, that said, it might sound like doom and gloom, but really at the end of the day, most, when we go into organizations, we find they have the data. Often it's not in the, all the, in the, all the, you know, it's not all in one place and it's to come from many different sources, but you can get the data and you can use it. And, it, and, and that's often a good place to start as well, is to look at what data you have and what personalization that can drive. Anthony, I think you're a proponent of the, the mentality um, of, you know, thinking big, starting small and then scaling from there. So can you elaborate on kind of why you think this is the third step in how we should approach this within our organizations? Yeah, I can, uh, David. Actually, 
uh, I've learned uh, a lot through the School of Hard Knocks. And <laughs> as, a, as a former business architect, um, I worked on a pretty large transformation program uh, for RBC many years ago. Um, pretty much every company that I've interacted with over the last 20 years has had a digital adoption program of some sort. Uh, the programs were and are a multi-layered, multi-dimensional uh, type of environment. Some, some have online channels, chatbots, mobile apps, IVRs, all those types of things. Many of those programs actually collapsed under their own weight and needed to be scaled back to deliver some real returns within a particular budget year. Uh, my, my counsel to those program custodians is you you got to, customers are ready for impactful, incremental improvements. It, it doesn't have to be the big bang. We've seen success in programs where they've identified the interactions that would benefit from a contextual digital experience and, and, and you know, go through the, the, the exercise of decomposing those large programs and find the most obvious customer engagement touch points and start right there. Just start and you'll find that customers will be forgiving of any minor improvements or opportunities along the path. But if you're going to, you have to think big. I think we all have a responsibility as leaders to think big about their digital strategy, but we always are faced with a challenge of how do you get started? So start small, but just start, just start. And Steve, just briefly, I'd, I'd be curious because I know that, that you work with, uh, I believe, smaller community uh, banks. And, uh, you know, in, in contrast to uh, maybe what Alan just described, do you, you think this holds true for that uh, group of customers, that group of financial institutions as well? Well, absolutely. I think, okay. um, you know, even going back to um, what we were talking about earlier about anticipating change and the, and the rapid pace of change. I think getting in that mindset of, of starting with those incremental changes and then going through fast cycles of change with very small incremental changes applies to everybody in the industry. Um, I, I think, um, number one, uh, if, you, if, you, if you make it too big, by the time you accomplish it, something's changed <laughs> where it's not relevant anymore. Especially in 2020, so, right? That's right. Yeah. So. So it's all about the next most important thing at a very small level, but having a large strategy to Anthony's point. Got it, got it. All right, Len, let's bring us home here on uh, points four and five here on this roadmap. Um, and I think you're gonna be touching on uh, aspects of you know, a marketing budget and, and the fact that they're shrinking and uh, many organizations have less full-time resources. So just give us uh, context on uh, steps four and five here. Yeah, I mean, I think the reality is uh, it's, it's, we, we are moving into an economy that is going to have to pay back what it's borrowed. Uh, things are going to be tight for the foreseeable future. To me, when I hear doing more with less in a pragmatic way, uh, again, I go down to financial institutions, whether medium, large, small, if, if they're going to sell products and services with humans, it's a very expensive proposition. Now, some complex things require humans and they should be used for those things. On the other hand, many of those real comparisons can be dealt with in the digital channel. So I think that doing more with less means if you're going to make every product sale or, or recommendation with a human, it's going to add a huge amount of cost. And it's not necessarily satisfying for the customer. So I think it comes down to lowering the cost of selling products, the cost of advising clients, and using the digital channel wisely to do that. And I think that you know what we've seen is some of these technologies that are quite powerful are, are at a price point now where you know even for us, you saw a TD example. And mm -hmm. I'd say even just a year and a half ago, yeah, we were essentially with tier ones with the budgets to support that. And today it's really open to any financial institution. We see the cost of the technologies as it has advanced has come down. And it was interesting hearing about how we're using data because of course, personalization technology uses existing data, 
But as importantly, it's the new data you get. You can use these technologies to interact. So if, if I'm, you know, finding out not just, you know, hey, here's what we know about you and based on your, you know, investments, you're going to have this much at retirement. I can ask you, well, is that going to meet your financial goals? And you can say yes or no and tell me how much you need in real time. We can then tell you how much you'll need to then put away to do that. That's typically a human interaction that could easily be done. And so these technologies have come down and I would say, explore and find out what you actually can do with quite, you know, reasonable budgets to try these technologies today. Fantastic. Now, uh, it looks like some folks are asking for the recording. Don't worry, we are going to get that. I want to spend a few minutes now in Q&A. There have been a lot of questions panel that have come in. Uh, folks, we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but we're certainly going to try to hit some of the, uh, some of the big ones that we see here. Uh, Andrew, if you're ready, I'm actually going to throw a question over to you here first. Um, just from your vantage point, what's the most common objection you hear when attempting to move an FI towards new digital solutions? And the, the, the follow-up to that is, is that objection changing in any way? Yeah, so I, I, I'm going to go back to, to base. That's a, that's a great question. And it's certainly one that, that I, as a consultant, you know, to the large FIs experience all the time. But I thought Len, you know, knocked it out of the park with his do more with less type answer, right? And mm. you really have to think full circle about, your marketing and your distribution costs, right? If you're using a human at, you know, whatever dollars an hour to talk to a client who may or may not pull through, um, you know, why the heck wouldn't you move that to a digital channel cover 10 times with, you know, it just, it just makes sense from an economic perspective. So I think really it's about changing the question. It's not about seeking, you know, the, the quarter million dollars, the few million dollars to, to build out a capability you know, you have to look at the whole picture, understand where the cost savings come in, and then drive the full benefits case, you know, right through the leadership of the organization. You got to talk to sales, operations, you know, front office, back office, you got to got to think of the whole process. This, this next question, I'm not sure who to throw it out to. So panel, I can see all of you. If you can raise your hand, if you think this is something you can speak to. Um, there are a lot in the audience who are, um, using print. There are either commercial printers who are servicing FIs or FIs that use print. And so this is a question from Tom saying um, many of his customers, sounds like he services FIs, print hundreds of thousands to millions of pages per day, and they're quite complex. They're both promotional work as well as transactional work. And so he's got two questions here. From your view, panel, how important is the print and mail component in the campaigns that we've discussed today? And um, if it's important, what specifically um, are the things that are, are, are important? Is it the merge speed? Is it the wide range of functionality? Is it the automation? Is it price? You know, kind of what are the things that are important regarding print and mail? So who thinks they're, they're good uh, at, at answering that one? Or I'm going to pick on somebody here. Anybody? <laughs> All right, I'm going to go for you, Len. I see you uh, thinking there. So how important from your view at Blue Rush do you see this print and mail component? I think it's extremely important. I think Alan Berger made the point earlier about how these need to start working together. And so, so that example of taking a statement and showing how you can get the print and actually a visualization, a video personalized together, yeah. kind of shows how these things can start to work together, right? So I think they can continue to advance, but there's no question print and there, there are efficiencies, people like storage of physical records. It's not going anywhere. I think it's a question of aligning it and hooking it up with some of the newer digital processes that are out there to improve it. I'm going to do a rapid fire question to all of you, and I'm going to go from left to right is, is what I see on my screen. I just want a yes or no answer here. Is cash going away? Andrew? No. There's too much of an underground economy. Steve? This will never go away. No. No? Len? Never. <laughs> Nobody's going to take the other position. Anthony? No? <laughs> All right, Alan, is cash going away? I would say in some circumstances, and there's going to be less of it um, okay. in circulation because of technology, technological solutions, but it's not going away completely. Yeah. Fascinating. 
Um, how do we address the underserved individuals and communities that lack access to the internet? It's a great question that just came in, and I know it also came in in advance. Um, so who would like to give us their thoughts on that? How, how should we think about reaching those that lack access to the internet? Yeah, Andrew, let's go with you. So I, I think it, it is a, a very delicate question and obviously one that needs to be done with, with due consideration of the reasons and all of that kind of stuff. But I think, you know, in this day and age, while they may lack, you know, fixed access to the internet and a, and a, and a full time, maybe a, a desktop computer at home, everybody has a mobile device Cell of phone. one sort or another. And, and mm -hmm. so whether it's making sure that you've got a low bandwidth offer that can be delivered over, you know, Starbucks Wi-Fi or, you know, really having a simple user interface or text chat, those kinds of capabilities. Um, it, it's really just about thinking through uh, your channel options that you're providing to your customers and always making sure there's a low bandwidth option. Next uh, question here. Did anybody else want to add to that by any chance? Did anybody else have another view of, of that? Okay. Uh, next question here is, given, given what we've seen with COVID-19, how can this kind of technology help financial companies with the eventuality of revenue decline? So, you know, how th this situation is impacting a lot of organizations. How do you think this technology can actually help increase revenues here? Who would like to weigh in on that? Yeah, go ahead, Anthony. Yeah, I think um, one of the things with the digital channel or, or the, the uh, various assets that are being delivered through a digital channel is that it allows you to actually gather um, in, in that customer experience, allows you to gather information that can make you help that customer make a decision faster and more and with more information that's relevant and contextual to what they're seeking, right? So marketing campaigns um, delivered through a digital channel have been extremely effective. Um, I don't want to speak for Blue Rush, but we're aware of, of some of the programs that they've launched to actually create uh, a personalized digital experience that has led to a greater uplift in people understanding their choices and making a decision in the moment because the information that they receive back is contextually personalized uh, to their situation. Well, with that, folks, I'm going to draw us to a close today. Thank you, everybody, for your time today. There are a lot of other questions here. Um, we will uh, go through those, and our teams will follow up with you. I want to thank Alan, Steve, Anthony, Andrew, and Len, and all the folks at Blue Rush for allowing me to host today's panel. You can get in touch with everyone on the webinar by scanning the, UR, the QR code. I believe all of these gentlemen are also on LinkedIn, so connect with them there. Yes, we will send out a copy of the, of the session today and uh, the slides for future reference. Um, so again, thank you, panel. Thank you, everyone in the audience. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day and that you got value out of today's presentation. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, Dave.